There once was a king who loved a humble maiden. The king was like no other king. Every statesman trembled at his power. No one dared breathe a word against him. He had the strength to crush all opponents. And yet this mighty king melted in love for a simple, humble maiden who lived in a poor village in his kingdom. How could he declare his love for her? In an odd sort of way, his kingliness tied his hands. If he brought her to the palace and crowned her head with jewels and clothed her body in royal robes, she would surely not resist. No one dared resist him. But would she love him? She would say that she loved him, of course, but would she truly? Or would she live with him in fear, nursing a private grief for the life that she had left behind? Would she be happy at his side? How could he know for sure? If he rode to her forest cottage in his royal carriage with an armed escort waving bright banners, that too would be overwhelming for her. He did not want a cringing subject. He wanted a lover an equal. He wanted her to forget that he was a king and that she was a humble maiden and to let shared love cross the gulf between them. For it is only in love that the unequal can be made equal. The king, convinced that he could not elevate the maiden without crushing her freedom, resolved to descend to her. Clothed as a beggar, he approached her cottage with a worn cloak fluttering loose about him. This was not just a disguise. The king took on a totally new identity. He had renounced his throne to declare his love and to win hers. So goes the parable by Soren Kierkegaard, who attempted to capture this remarkable story of the almighty king who descended to this earth to declare his love and to win our love to himself. A God who stripped himself of all divine power and came to be nothing but a humble servant. The passage that we're going to be looking at today is found in John chapter 13, as we've just heard the reading of that word. It is one of the most powerful examples of the Almighty King who became a servant. We're working through the Gospel of John, as you know. We've been looking at various passages. We're not looking at every single passage. But we are paying particular attention to what does it mean to be apprentice to the King, apprentice to Jesus. We're listening, we're learning, we're we're gleaning from how Jesus taught and how he lived, and so that we would know how to become more and more like him. And so we come to this passage. And this passage is the beginning of the second half of the Gospel of John. From now on, we're going to be focused on the death of Christ, the reason why he came. At the beginning of this chapter, John tells us that it was a time of Passover. Now, Passover is uh, the greatest festival of uh, the Jews. It is estimated that possibly up to three million people came to Jerusalem for this week. There was a lot of anticipation and excitement about the fact that Jesus might be there, the one who raised someone from the dead, Lazarus of Bethany. And so they were gathered together, and no wonder they were lining the streets, and they were clamoring to see a picture of him as he entered into that city on a donkey, and they started shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. In a couple of months, we too will be celebrating, commemorating this event called Palm Sunday when we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. What's interesting, though, is that we don't often realize or talk about the fact that this is a very similar scene that happened 140 years earlier when Simon Maccabeus had victory over the occupying Syrian forces. When he came into the town, the people also exclaimed, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That phrase comes from Psalm 118. And that psalm was written during a time when there were warring nations all around Israel. And as, the, as there was victory over those occupying, uh, over those nations, they proclaimed, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the, one, the hero, the one that 
conquer, the conquering hero who liberated them from their nations around them. The word Hosanna means save now. It is equivalent to what we might say, God save the king. Jesus is most assuredly king. Far greater than we can ever think or imagine. Although the people didn't quite fully agree with that. Uh, they thought he was going to be the one, but they were very disappointed in the fact that he did not become, lead a rebellion and, le- and conquer the nation around them. But Jesus did, in fact, meet the needs of the people in a profound and glorious way. Over the next five chapters in the Gospel of John, we'll read more about the actual events and the discourse that happened in the upper room. The upper room meaning where the disciples met to have their last supper before Jesus died the next day. And as they entered in this room, there was an obvious thing that was missing that was most commonly practiced in those days. And that was to take a basin of water and a towel and wash each other's feet. You see, in in Palestine in those days, the, there was just simply dirt roads, and, and they just had simple footwear. There was just a, a, a sole and some straps that would tie around their feet, and as they were walking every step, their feet would get more increasingly dirty from the, from the dirt of the road or from the mud if it was wet. And so it was a very common practice for the servant to greet the guests at the door, and inside the front entrance was the basin of water and a towel. But on that night, Jesus sent his disciples as they gathered together. No one was thinking about that. No one was thinking about doing a menial task such as this. No, their thoughts were much higher than that. They were much grander, much more lofty than that. They were talking about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They were thinking about being the commander. They were thinking about being the leader. They were thinking about power and glory. And Luke tells us very clearly that the disciples started arguing about who is going to be the greatest in this kingdom. So taking on the role to wash each other's feet was far from their minds. And we continue in John chapter 13, where it says that as the evening was progressing, the devil had already prompted Judas, so you have that image. The son of Simon is scary to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had already put all things under his power, that he had come from God and he was returning to God. And then he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he, after that, he poured water into the basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And when he came to Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And so we have the story of Jesus, the almighty God, the king of kings, is found here stooping down and washing the dirt off the disciples' feet. We are taken aback by this image The usual symbol of a king's power is one who sits on a high and lofty throne, crowns and jewels all around him, and the scepter in his hand. That's the image that we often have when we think of the king of kings. But Jesus turns that image upside down, and he shows us the power of a towel. This is where his real authority lies. There are lots of different principles we can talk about. I'm going to be talking about four principles that we can glean from the use of this towel that Jesus has in his hand. And the first one is it represents or symbolizes his true nature. What Jesus did that night was not a a one-off. It was not something unique as far as his character concerned. It wasn't something that Jesus did as as an attempt to show to his people how humble he is, but when he really isn't. It wasn't that kind of a thing. Rather, it was a true part of who he was, his true nature. And it symbolized what Jesus did as he descended from heaven, entered into earth, and returned. Look at the text again. John says that when Jesus got up from the table, it's a reminder of the fact that he rose from his eternal throne in heaven. 
When Jesus took off his robe and his outer garments, it's just as if he took off the robe of his glory in heaven. And just as he had taken off the garments of the divine privilege of being the Son of God. And then it says Jesus wrapped the towel around himself, just as he wrapped around himself humanity, flesh, and blood. Jesus then washed his disciples' feet, performing this menial task, just as he did the very next day when he died a degrading death of a common criminal. And when Jesus finished washing the feet, John says that Jesus put on his robe again and returned to his place of honor at the table, just as Jesus did after he cried out, It is finished. He was taken up from the grave and seated with God and the Heavenly Father. Jesus' use of the towel here in this place was most likely the inspiration for the early church as they sang that great hymn that Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." That night in the upper room, the eternal Son of God, the Almighty God, the creator of all creatures, he stripped off his garments and he kneeled before the disciples and he washed the dirt off of their feet. This wasn't anything new. This is the actual revelation of the true nature of this remarkable king. The second principle that we get from this passage of Jesus' use of the towel on that night reveals God's understanding of true royalty, his perspective of what it really means. And as you might already guess, it's going to be different than what we would usually think. Peter, in fact, was horrified by the idea that this king would come and wash his feet, knowing full well that this shouldn't be the case, that he should instead be washing his feet. This is certainly beneath the role of such a distinguished ruler. And so Peter blurts out these words, No, you shall never wash my feet. As I read that, I was reminded of Jesus blurting out a few other words before. Matthew chapter 16, when they were in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus was just telling the disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem where he was going to die, and Peter blurts out, Heaven forbid! May this never happen to you. And how does Jesus respond? Jesus says, Get away from me, Satan. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And so it is the case in the upper room that Peter was still thinking in terms of a human perspective, not from God's. Peter wanted Jesus to fit into his view of what it meant to be a royal king. Peter couldn't wrap his head around this idea of a divine king washing his feet. And yet, Pete, and yet Jesus shatters our concept of what it means to be truly the divine king. When we think of king of kings, again, we think of somebody who is sitting on a high and lofty throne with a royal scepter and jewels and surrounded by willing servants, all willing to do his bidding. But this king of kings, he shows up with a towel in his hand, ready to wash the feet of those who should be serving him. This is the reality of the living God, the one willing to abdicate, to descend, to serve the creatures that he has created. Leslie Newbegin, who's a, a well-known theologian and author, he writes this observation. It's kind of a, a long quote, and if you can't read it, just listen along. 
he writes this, this is not just an active lesson in humility. Peter could have understood that. The foot washing is a sign of that ultimate subversion of all human authority which took place when Jesus was crucified by the decision of the powers that rule this present age. In that act, the wisdom of this world was shown to be folly, and the powers of this world were disarmed. But flesh and blood, ordinary human nature, is in principle incapable of understanding this. It is the Jew a scandal, to the Greek folly. Only those whom the risen Christ will call and to whom the Holy Spirit will be given will know that this folly is the wisdom of God and this weakness is the power of God. At that moment, as the man he is, Peter cannot understand. The natural man makes gods in his own image. A supreme God will be the one who stands at the summit of the chain of command. How can the natural man recognize this supreme God in the stooping figure of a slave clad only with a loincloth? The truth is, Peter would have been perfectly happy with washing the feet of Jesus. That would have made a lot more sense to him. But Jesus... The great I am stoops before Peter and reaches for his dirty feet. Now that's not normal. That doesn't line up with his understanding of what royalty is all about. So what is Jesus doing here? He's helping Peter and us come to grips with what is the true divine royalty. That the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus turns it upside down. The King of Kings serves us, and we will never be able to outserve him. So what is your reaction to all of this? I don't know if you've ever participated in a foot washing ceremony or not, but if you have, you know that it can be a humbling experience. Now I want you to imagine that God Almighty is washing your feet. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? Not with him. <laughs> On the one hand, I think we can be amazed at God's humility, his ability and his willingness to do that. But on the other hand, I can actually relate to Peter. And, and I can think to myself, this is disturbing that God would do this. And if you dig deep enough, you might be able to discover that this idea is actually rooted in our own pride. Because we have a tendency to create God in our image. And we put that view upon God instead of allowing his view come to us. In fact, we want to serve him the way we think we need to serve him. We want to express from our perspective how great we think he is. Daryl Johnson, a pastor and author, he considers this problem, and he writes this. A God on his knees before me humbles me and strangely makes me more God-centered. You see, if my only view of God is that of a supreme king at the summit of the chain of command, a king on the top rung of the ladder... It actually makes me more self-centered. I'm always wondering, how will I get to him? And worrying about how I am doing. Am I making progress toward him? What can I do to make my way up to him? It is our natural bent to be preoccupied with ourselves. But when we see a God kneeling, stooping down to take our feet and wash them, that kind of self-emptying love, it just rattles us. It takes us off center so that we can only be preoccupied with him. It's the kind of love that knocks us off of our own throne and, and taking us off of our desire for self-promotion. Jesus then becomes the center. And we begin to realize that the only way to reach out to the living God is to go to the bottom of the rung, of the ladder where he is. Jesus' view of divine royalty 
is being a foot washer. This leads us to the third principle that Jesus teaches us with his towel on that night. The towel points to the reason why he came, and that is to die on the cross. John begins the section by telling us that Jesus knew that the hour had come. He also tells us that the devil had already prompted Judas. Even the language that John uses about laying aside his garments, as the NASB says, laid aside his garments, it's very similar to the words we just read last week from John 10, when Jesus says, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. All of this serves to link this foot washing directly to the supreme reason why Jesus came to this earth, to die on the cross for our sins. And this helps us understand the interaction that Jesus had with Peter. After Peter blurts out, no, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus replies, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus is saying that, Peter, if you don't let me be who I am, if you don't allow me to do what I've come to do, if you're not allowing me to die on the cross to wash you clean, you have no part of me. You cannot be a part of my kingdom. And this is the ultimate act of stooping in service to wash feet is actually the death on the cross, the cleansing of our sins. And Peter seems to understand this to some degree because then he blurts out even more. He says, okay, well, not just my feet, but wash my hands and my head as well. And in that video that we watched, we saw some laughter from Jesus. I don't know if Jesus would have laughed at that moment or not, but it is kind of interesting because Jesus responds, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. What is Jesus saying here? Well, again, part of the culture is that before you went to a banquet or a large event, something like this, that you would actually have a bath before you left. And as you are traveling to the location, your feet get dirty. And all that is necessary to be washed are your feet. And so when Jesus washes Peter's feet, he points this out, that the only thing needed for you, Peter, is for you to do my work on the cross. The only thing that is necessary is for me to die and to wash you clean. You don't have to be perfect, Peter. You don't have to do anything else. The only way that you can get to heaven and to be part of my kingdom is by the work that I'm doing for you right now. The towel points to the death of the king. And now we reach the fourth and final principle that I'm going to be sharing with you about Jesus' use of the towel on that night. And perhaps you've already anticipated this, but we do need to ask the question, what do we need to learn as apprentices of Jesus as we watch him with a towel? We know that the towel represents his true nature. We know that it is upside-down perspective of the divine royalty. We know that it points to the death and the cleansing of our sins. We know that the people who are marked by this distinction of those who allow the king to serve him. That is a distinguishing mark of his followers. After washing their feet, Jesus says this to the disciples. Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet you also should wash one another's feet. I served, uh, some of you may or may not know this, I served in a Brethren in Christ church for a few years as pastor. They are our kissing cousins of our Mennonite Brethren denomination. And uh, they used to be called Brethren in Christ. They just recently changed their name to Be in Christ. You may know uh, Bruxy Cavey, who is a popular speaker at the Meeting House in Toronto. That's part of the Be in Christ. And the symbols have changed a little bit. They still are the same symbols. It's still three basic symbols of their logo. And that is the cross and the, whole, the dove, which represents the Holy Spirit and some of the uh, pietistic movements that influenced them. And then the water basin and towel. It was part of their 
experience in the early years of their denomination that we would gather together for communion once a month and then the men and women would separate and they would wash each other's feet. And it was a very powerful experience. And I certainly don't have any problem with that activity. It can be very meaningful. But I want you to understand what Jesus was thinking when he was washing the disciples' feet. He's basically saying, I'm laying down my life for you. I will go to the cross for you. So let's hear these words again very carefully. After Jesus washed their feet, he said, Since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Now something Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't say, Since I washed your feet, you need to wash my feet. He doesn't actually say that. He says, I want you to wash one another's feet. The problem with that might have been that we would rush to it and want to be the first person with a towel and basin to wash his feet. But Jesus says, no, I want you to wash one another's feet. Leslie Newbegin again makes this observation, what I think is very a powerful statement about this. He says this, Jesus has laid aside his life for us all. And the debt which we owe to him is to be discharged by our subjection to our neighbors in loving service. Our neighbor is the appointed agent authorized to receive what we owe the master. Would you not agree that we owe everything to Jesus our master? Of course we do. But we do this through the washing of others' feet to those around me. And so for me, my wife is the appointed agent authorized to receive what I owe Jesus. My staff are the appointed agent authorized to receive what I owe Jesus. You as a church, my life group, my employer, my neighbors are all authorized, appointed agents authorized to receive what I owe Jesus, the King. This is what I believe Paul is getting at in Ephesians. When, G when Paul is talking to us about what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? What does it mean to operate with Jesus living inside of us? What does that actually look like? And he gets real practical in chapter 5, and he says this is what it looks like when you are filled with the Spirit of Jesus the King. He says this in verse 21 of chapter 5, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit. Subject. What does submit means? It literally means to stand under. And so Paul says that's a sign of a person who has been touched by the Spirit of Jesus. The King of Jesus is the one who actually stands under. They place themselves at the disposal of others. And he talks about this in three spheres of our relationships. He talks about in marriage, in our family, and also in employment. And we respond to the debt that we owe God by standing under and submitting ourselves to others in those relationships. So how do I wash the feet of Jesus? By washing the feet of our spouse, by submitting to our children, by submitting to our parents, by submitting to our church, to our neighbors. I wash Jesus' feet as I stand under in those relationships. Now I know this is uncomfortable. And I know that you are already thinking in your mind all the reasons why this is not good. That we shouldn't do this. And we have good reason, good valid reasons why this is inappropriate. This is irrational. Especially in light of the fact that we live in a society where individual rights are at such a high premium. This is absolutely ridiculous. And in some ways, I would definitely agree with you. It is not the norm. It does destabilize our society, but that's precisely what the King of Kings is trying to do. His kingdom is upside down. He changes our whole concept of power and authority and status. When the disciples were arguing about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus replies and says this, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Notice that, lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not 
so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's not about being over somebody. It's about being under. The king of kings did not enter this world with a lightning bolt and a thunderous uh, announcement or surrounded by jewels and crowns. He came as a servant with a towel in his hand. And the world stumbles over each other to try to climb to the top of the ladder, trying to get more power and more authority. But what distinguishes us as the new humanity is the self-emptying love of the king, and we stumble over one another to get to the bottom, to get under. In a book entitled uh, To End All Wars, which is also made into a movie, it's a true story of, uh, of what happened to a bunch of prisoners in the Japanese prison camp in World War II. And uh, Gordon, Ernest Gordon is the individual that tells the story, and according to him, he says that the first few months of living in this camp were actually absolutely brutal. Prisoners were abused and tortured and worked to exhaustion as they were working on a, a railroad. And their hatred filled them for their captors. The camp was filled with rancor and with despair, and each, mo- each man fought for themselves. One day, the prisoners were, were brought out, and after some work on the railroad, they were lined up, and it was determined that there was a missing shovel. And so the Japanese soldiers uh, demanded that the person who lost their shovel to step forward. No one did. They raised their machine guns and said, if no one comes forward, you all will die. So eventually, one man stood forward. The Japanese soldier took a shovel and beat him to death. Soon afterwards, one of the prisoners became deathly ill, and another individual took compassion upon him and gave him his own towel and shivered through the night. He saved his meager rations of bread and soup and fed him to his sick friend, and in time his friend did recover, but the man, Scotty, his name was, uh, fell over dead a few days later. He literally had given himself over to save his friend. I forgot to mention a key part of the person that stepped forward. The shovel was found later on, and he he actually stepped forward of his own accord to save the life of his friends. And so those acts of selflessness transformed the camp. And in the days that followed, the hatred at bitterness and selfishness started to disappear from the prisoners. And they began to act in love towards one another, sharing their, ra- their rations, nursing each other's wounds, showing kindness, even towards their captors. And when the Allied forces eventually came to rescue them, these prisoners actually stood in the middle of between the Allied forces and their captors, and, and, their, and their, uh, uh, the ones who had captured them. And they said there would be no more killing. If love can transform a prison camp, it can transform you. It can transform your relationships. It can transform this church. It won't happen by exerting yourself over someone, but to place yourself under, to act in the interests of others, no matter who they are, no matter how it feels, no matter what the costs, because that's what Jesus did for us. That's how we can wash his feet. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, you are the King of Kings, and we thank you for this great example of what it means, your true nature. And we have to admit, God, this is a a difficult and troublesome message. We do acknowledge that you are the King worthy of worship. We do acknowledge that you are the one that spoke the worlds into existence. You gave life to all of your creatures. 
We acknowledge that, that you came not to, not to be served, but to serve. That you laid aside your divine privileges and you became nothing. And that you were obedient to death, even death on a cross. But Jesus, this story of the towel, it rattles us. That you stooped down on your knees and took our filthy feet and washed them with your own hands which symbolizes the washing of our sins. It rattles our understanding of what it means to be your follower. And so we thank you that this towel represents your true nature that is a distinguishing mark of those who, who have allowed you to serve them. And when I am unwilling to pick up the towel and serve someone, I guess it really means that I have lost sight of what you have done for me. And so, Jesus, I pray for, for myself and for others who are either unwilling or unable to pick up the towel. Will you show us once again who you are? And I invite you to pray a simple prayer for yourself. You can just simply ask, Jesus, will you come and wash my feet again? May you allow the king to stoop down to show his self-emptying love to you. Receive that love to the full. Let it break down that hard exterior. Let it break down your desire for self-promotion, that self-defense that we hold on to ourselves. Let it transform you from the inside out. Thank you, Jesus. You are the King of glory. Hosanna to the King. Amen.